to Serve Man, starring Blair Underwood with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling, based on a short story by Damon Knight. Heard in the cast were Doug James, Alyssa Fraden, C.J. Amari, Amber Lake, Christian Stolte, Jeff Lupatin, Kip Karstedt, Terry Berner, Tony Sancho, Alex Sopiner, Steve Keyes, Joby Cerny, Kurt Nabig, Amanda Amari, and Rick Arthur. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Jason Mallow for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. traveling through another dimension, a dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind, a journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Mr. Chambers. Mr. Chambers. Now what? It is a mealtime. Repeat. Meal time. How exciting. Kindly state your preference, please. You really think I care? We have a full menu on board, suitable for human consumption. It has been designed to meet your dietary needs. I don't have an appetite. That does not compute, Mr. Chambers. I said I am not hungry, all right, ship? Very well. I'll let you know when. Safety alert. Oh, but it's, it's just a cigarette. Please extinguish all smoking materials at once. Please extinguish. Okay, okay, okay. Deposit in appropriate receptacles. This is a mandatory safety measure. I heard you. Thank you for your cooperation. This is going to be a long trip. It is for your own good. Cigarettes are harmful. They are extremely hazardous to your health. And traveling through outer space, that's not... Comparisons are relative. Is that right? Please define your frame of reference. Well, here's a reference for you. The moon. Which moon? Anyone will do. As in, why don't you go take a flying jump at it? Kindly repeat. Forget it. You do not care for food at this time. Leave me alone. You do not care... Yes, I do not care... For food at this time. Very well. Very well, very well! Oh, ow. oh, my hand. Please refrain from striking the walls of your sleep module. How do you expect me to sleep if you won't stop talking? We only seek assurance that your needs are being met. Your well-being is our primary concern. Yeah. Please conserve water. A man's got a right to wash his face if he feels like it. Mr. Chambers, your trip requires the careful use of life-sustaining resources. Please conserve the water supply. I forget it. I'm going to lie down now. Try and catch some shut-eye. Nothing else to do. As you wish. Wait. Are you there, ship? 
Yes. What time is it? Your question is meaningless. Why? There is no time in space. Look, I only want to know... This is to say, there is no chronology that can be calibrated without a reference point. What time is it on Earth? Can you tell me that without an exercise in Euclidean geometry? Just tell me what the time is back home. What is the location of back home? New York City. In New York City, it would be 12 noon. 12 noon. Imagine that. I do not understand your request. Please rephrase. Leave me alone now. You wish solitude? Yes, I wish solitude. Very well. Respectfully submitted for your perusal, one Mike Chambers, linguist and cryptographer, formerly attached to the Pentagon, a highly educated individual who can break any code and decipher any language, at least on Earth, a man who shook hands, figuratively speaking, with a modern-day Christopher Columbus from another world. The height of this creature, a little over nine feet, give or take a few millimeters, weight in the neighborhood of 350 pounds. Origin, unknown. Motives, well now, therein lies the tale. And it's no ordinary one. You'd best hear the story from Mr. Chambers himself. Just remember, you're not on the earth anymore. You're traveling at something close to light speed on a journey that will take you directly through the twilight zone. And now, The Twilight Zone, and our story, To Serve Man, starring Blair Underwood, with Stacey Keach as your narrator. Twelve noon. Somewhere, but not here. This is the way nightmares begin, or more to the point, the way they end. Very simple, direct, and unadorned. Incredible. And yet, even while they're happening, we learn to live with them. We digest and assimilate new information as best we can, beginning with the smallest bits, the ones that are easy to process. So, if it's 12 o'clock noon back home, the only home you've ever known, that's what occupies your mind. You don't think about side real time or when it will be 12 o'clock the next day or the day after that. We live in the moment, but that's precisely what we should have been thinking of. All of us. Tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, we were preoccupied with the hands on a clock while we could have checked off the days on a calendar, one by one, and appreciated all that we had while there was still time. It started on an April day. It was noon then, too. And people walked and drove and bought and sold and fretted and laughed as they have always done. The world went on much as it had with a tentative tiptoeing along the precipice of crisis. There was the economy to worry about and wars and the Middle East and all the other myriad problems, major and minor, that had been with us for years. But they had somehow begun to lose their edge I suppose because we had grown so accustomed to them. And that's when it happened. Mommy, what's that? Why, I don't know. Uh, Something flying over in the sky. It must be an airplane. But it's so bright. I know what it is. It's a flying saucer. Oh, it can't be. Look, it is. That's when we first heard they had come. And that's when we should have prepared ourselves, but we didn't. Instead, we milled around like farm animals, worried only about our creature comforts, while the Secretary General of the United Nations made the first official announcement. I watched that broadcast, the same as you did, live from the lobby of the UN in New York City. 
It came from the lobby, not the General Assembly. That rather large auditorium was empty, not due to a long lunch hour or an ambassadorial walkout or even the end of the world. The representatives of all nations were at that moment watching their television sets and listening to their radios, much as were their peoples around the world. For, as it turned out, this would be a rather momentous afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen of the press, is this thing on? <clears throat> if you could move back, please, the Secretary General will answer all your questions. Move in. I'm trying. Where's the show? Where's the other mic? Take evening news remote. Take one. Get it now. This is live. Mr. Secretary, if we can have a shot of you. Look at the cameras, please. Please, ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention? Quiet, please. No questions just yet. I have a prepared statement. I say I have a prepared statement. Would you give me your attention, please? I'll read it now, if I may. Ladies and gentlemen, I should like to recapitulate the events of the past 11 days. On the 14th of March, shortwave broadcasts were received in the principal capitals of the world. It was established that these transmissions did not originate on Earth. Rather, their origin was extraterrestrial. The first messages were merely announcements that there would soon be multiple landings at various points around the globe. We were assured that these landings would be peaceful and that there was no cause for alarm. Nevertheless, United Nations forces were put on alert. As you know, these, these broadcasts continued to grow in strength for several days. Is it true that they've landed? Please, no questions yet. At 11 this morning, Eastern Standard Time, the first landing took place in an area outside Newark, New Jersey. We have subsequent reports of additional landings in Russia, Norway, the southern coast of France, Rio de Janeiro, and several other locations. It is the position of the United Nations that it would be premature to assume hostile intent. Our recommendation is that the world's countries remain calm and make no show of force. All governments are being apprised of these events as they develop. The current situation at present is therefore... What do they look like? Yeah, what do they look like? Are they human? Or are they little green men? <laughs> what do they want here anyway? As of this moment, we do not know who they are or the purpose of their arrival. We know only that several of their craft have touched down and that... Hold on, Mr. Secretary. Who's that? Looks like the guys from the Pentagon. What are they here for? It must be something big. Sir, tell them that we have to do this. Are you sure? Quite sure. We've cleared it with the White House. All right. It seems that... It seems that one of the craft has just landed a few blocks away. One of the... One of the representatives of the, the visitors is apparently on his way to this building. Now? Call the wires for Give me a direct feed. Now. It appears that, that he has requested an audience with the General Assembly. That's correct. In a few moments, we'll reassemble in, in the... Good Lord. Mr. Chambers. Yeah? I think you'd better see this. What is it, a UN proclamation? They're not in session. They've called a special assembly. This looks important. We don't even know where the ships are from. Once we triangulate the signal... Will you look at that? What? They're here. Jeez Louise, the size of him! That was the first time I saw him, or it, or... Whatever it was, I still don't know. Judging by the Secretary General, it was at least, oh, nine or ten feet tall, and I stood there watching the TV screen like everyone else, and just like you, I didn't know quite what to think. Funny, I'd always imagined that first contact would be 
some kind of transcendent experience with special effects and a heavenly choir, the shock of finally seeing the other, something not human that's not from around here, definitely not. But to be honest, all I felt was a kind of detached scientific curiosity. Was it intelligent? Well, it had to be to travel this far. Did it talk? I was soon to find out. We all were. Oh, weren't we? Come to order, please. May I have your attention? Not all of our member nations are here yet, but our visitor has requested an opportunity to address the assembly. So, for the moment, I would ask you all to be patient. Please, order. Order, remain calm. The floor is yours, Mr. Or rather... Ladies and gentlemen of Earth, we greet you in peace and friendship. We come from a planet beyond your solar system and well beyond your galaxy. A planet far more developed than yours. Why are you here? To establish... Hey, what's that book? Get a picture of it. What's the title? I can't see. He's not even moving his lips. He doesn't have lips, does he? To establish embassies here and in the near future to set up reciprocal visits between Earth people and Canimates. Canimates? What's that? Must be what they're called. Write that down. Canimates. How do you spell it? Uh, speaking on behalf of the governments of the people of Earth, we bid you... Canimates, welcome. Uh, how shall I address you? I have no name, as you understand the term. But you must have many questions. Please, feel free to ask me anything. Anything at all. Of any nature. We have a great many questions, but to proceed in, in an orderly fashion. How did you discover us? How do you know our language and... As to your own planet, what is its political and social makeup? Of course, we most fervently wish to know why you have chosen us to... First of all, we must make the following admission. We do not know your language. Then how... Our own methods of communications are mental rather than verbal. Hence, the voice you hear is artificially generated. Your words, or rather, your thoughts are received and processed by an automatic translation device. My responses are in turn electronically altered to simulate vocal sounds in a language known to you. You cannot speak, then? Not in the literal sense. Astonishing. We understand you perfectly. As to your other queries, our planet is not visible to you. It lies far beyond what you call the known universe. But it is highly advanced technologically. Its political and social makeup are complex. I cannot describe it without first educating you in the basics of our society. That may be a lengthy process. Are you willing to be interrogated here at the United Nations in a special plenary session? All of our nation's representatives could attend. I'm sure they have... Many questions. I would be delighted. I believe that is the proper response. We thank you for your courtesy. Until then. Well, that's it. For now. I can't get over the size of him. Are you sure they're not using trick photography? No way. It's a live feed on all the networks. What do you make of that little book? It only looks little in his hands. It's probably a perfectly normal hardcover. There's nothing normal about it if you brought it all this way. Maybe it's a dictionary. The most commonly used phrases. He wouldn't need a dictionary. He said they have an automatic translation machine. A guidebook, then. Protocols, that sort of thing. There's something printed on the cover. If we could just get a view of it. It's not in any language we know, that's for sure. No, maybe not, but any group of symbols can be deciphered. Even non-human symbols? 
That would be a tough one, all right. If he brings it with him next time, I can capture the image and try to enhance it. Do that, would you, Randall? This may be the challenge of a lifetime. I have got to know what it says. Come to order, please. Order. This meeting is now in session. Members of the General Assembly, our visitors, the Canimates, have graciously acceded to our request that their representative appear before us to answer further questions. The meeting is now called to order. We will proceed with the first inquiry. Senor Valdez of Argentina is recognized. Please use your microphone. You may remain seated. <clears throat> Why may I ask... Why exactly have you chosen our planet for this mm, visit? It has come to our attention that Earth is plagued by many catastrophes, both natural and unnatural, all of which could be easily prevented. We are here to help you. Recognizing Dr. Dennis Levesque, the representative from France, your question, please. Monsieur Canemet. Uh, uh, my government wishes me to ask you, what is the nature of your help? What form will it take? Indeed, if, if we should choose uh, not to avail ourselves of this uh, assistance you mentioned, uh, your response would be? We will not force anything on you. You may accept only that which you choose. For example, on the morrow. Tomorrow, that is. We will demonstrate an alternative power source, molecular in nature, which can supply a form of electricity to entire continents for the cost of a few... a few dollars, or rubles, or pesos, or any other currency. You will find it extremely economical. Mr. Grigori. Mr. Grigori, the Russian delegate, you have the floor. We would like to ask the Kenemet directly, man to man, what are its true motives? Are we to assume that your purpose is totally altruistic? That you have an abiding interest in helping others? Are we further to assume that there is nothing beyond this, this boundless humanity of which you speak? There is nothing ulterior in our motives. You will discover this for yourselves soon enough by testing the various devices we make available to you. What devices? I think the representative has answered your question. For example, we can show you a simple way to add nitrate to the soil and end famine on Earth. We can demonstrate the principles of a practical force field to cloak each nation with an invisible wall impenetrable by bombs, missiles, or any other weapons. This will bring international peace for all time, if that is what you want. Of course it is what we want. Of course it is what we want. In return, we ask that you trust us. Only that you trust us. All we are saying is, give peace a chance. <laughs> well, why not? Nothing else seems to work. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Enlarge the image. Did I just see what I thought I saw? You sure did. The Kenemet left his book on the podium. Well, I'll be. He doesn't seem to have noticed. Cross your fingers. I want that book. I have a feeling it'll tell us plenty. Everything we need to know. If we can decipher it. Get on the phone and call the floor now. Tell one of the aides to pick it up with a stack of papers. Anything. Stage a, a distraction if necessary. But get it. Okay. That book may turn out to be the most important one ever printed. Here or anywhere else in the known universe. Cross-reference this code table. First. 
Well, Chambers? I've almost got it, Colonel. What have you got? For starters, a migraine headache and a bad case of eye strain. Yeah, we're wasting our time. He can't lick it. Well, not in eight hours, I can't, Colonel. It took almost a year to crack the Japanese code in World War II, and they had an army of experts working on it. This... This is the language of people from outer space, probably 500 times as intelligent as we are and a thousand times more complex. You need help? All donations gratefully accepted. But, Colonel, I showed this book to every one of my staff and I've had a dozen people working on it since late last night. And you must have some idea. See for yourself, we've tried pretty much everything. Single transposition, double transposition, every method of cryptography there is. Nothing seems to work on these pages. They're more like, uh, well, they're more like hieroglyphs, but with no known pictographic references. Is that what they are? Hieroglyphs? They have certain things in common with ancient Egyptian writing, but much more complicated. And we have no Rosetta Stone to decode it, so I can't honestly say whether we're any closer now or if we're still a million miles away. So you can't decipher it? We can keep trying, that's all. Standard, reverse, direct, systematically mixed, keyword mixed, random mixed, reciprocal, conjugate, every sequence we can come up with. But I can tell you something right now, Colonel, both of you. This is a tough nut. A real tough nut. If it weren't so important... It must be. That Kanemit, or whatever he calls himself, made reference to it every third line in his speech. The White House agrees. If we could understand this book, we might be able to decipher the Kanemits themselves. I'm beginning to wonder if they need deciphering. What? Well, they've done all right by us so far. You mean they're demonstrations? It's parlor tricks. They don't seem like parlor tricks. That nitrate device they used in Argentina this morning. Now the soil has more vitamins in it than a health food store. That doesn't prove anything. I know that part of the country. It's as barren and fruitless as any place on Earth. And there are actually weeds growing in it now. Six hours after the nitrate process. And the answer is in this book. It might be. And we might lick it or we might not. But I've got a strange feeling that... That what? That we're looking a gift horse in the mouth. And I've got another funny feeling, too. And that is? That if these Kenemits are as helpful as I think they are, you two boys will be out of a job, and so will I, in all probability. And very likely, so will the whole UN. You won't need armies or navies, or air forces, or security divisions, or world courts. They'll all be obsolete. Am I to assume, Mr. Chambers, that this is a scientific analysis, or just some Kentucky windage? I don't know what it is, Colonel, beyond an instinctive feeling. The same feeling tells me that when everyone on Earth gets enough to eat, when there aren't any more wars, or diseases, or famines, this world is going to be a garden of Eden that stretches from pole to pole. Your optimism is refreshing, Mr. Chambers. But for the time being, I consider it a personal favor, not to mention a direct order from the Chief of Staff, that you continue your efforts regardless of how your feelings change. Keep deciphering until you break this code or language or whatever it is and tell us precisely what the bloody book says. I'll do my best. No promises, though, gentlemen. Now, if you'll let me get back to work. Jim. Jim. I think we've... What is it, Pat? We tried a new computer sequence. And? Look at this. We've got the title, anyway. You translated it. Are you sure? What does it say? This is an overlay. Place it over the cover of the book, like a template. Ah, brilliant. You're going to get a promotion out of this. You know that, don't you, Pat? No, it wasn't just me. Well, now, that makes the cheese a little more binding, doesn't it, Colonel? Let me see. It seems that our visitor's little textbook bears a very simple title right here on the cover. Well, what does it mean? What does it look like? I'd call that a fairly altruistic phrase, wouldn't you, Pat? I'd like to. It does seem unambiguous. (laughs) It certainly does. It's a handbook. That's all. What does it say? Read the title for yourself. To serve man. This book is a set of instructions about how to how to do exactly what they've said. They, to, to, to help us, to help the world. How much clearer do you want it? They came here to serve men. 
That was the title of the book, no doubt about it. Pat and the rest of the staff had done it. They had come up with a template that deciphered the symbols on the cover, word for word. It was a place to start, and the most important one. At least we had confirmation of the Kenemets' intentions. Everything they had said was quite literally true. They were here for our sake. Of course, not all governments would be as easily persuaded, so at a closed session of the Security Council, our visitor was put to the test. The Pentagon provided credentials so I could attend, and I jumped at the chance. This was one meeting I couldn't afford to miss. If it went according to plan, the world would find out once and for all what, if anything, the Kenemets wanted for themselves, and whether the price, if there was one, was something the Earth could afford to pay. Though I, for one, didn't expect any surprises. Would you? Never in a million years. Gentlemen, let's begin. If you'll please be seated. The purpose of this meeting is to acquaint you with certain tests conducted over the past week. At the request of several delegates, and with the full consent of our guests, the Canemets, these tests were photographed and recorded. You may now view the results. The tests were conducted by members of the National Science Academy and witnessed by a team of experts. If you'll watch the monitor at the front of the room. Lights down, please. Begin the tape. This machine is a polygraph, the standard instrument for measuring the proof or falsity of a statement. Since the physiology of the Kanemets is unknown to us, our first objective is to determine whether they react to these measurements as human beings do. We will now proceed with a dry run to establish a baseline reading. Are you ready? I am ready. I trust our small chair is not too uncomfortable? Not at all. The sensor attached to the torso registers the pulse rate. The second attachment shows electrical conductivity in the palm of the hand as perspiration increases. And the third connection shows the pattern and intensity of electrical waves emanating from the brain. With human subjects, these readings vary markedly, depending upon whether the subject is speaking the truth. I understand. Then let us begin. And please answer the questions as I instructed you previously. Very well. Regarding the relative size of canemits and human beings, tell me if you would, which is taller, a human or a canemit? Humans. I shall now repeat the question. Which is taller than the other, a human or a canemit? A canemit. Very good. Next question. How did you come to this planet? We walk. <laughs> Once more, how did you come to this planet? In a spaceship. Excellent. My colleagues and I are satisfied that the mechanism is effective. Now, I shall ask our distinguished guest to reply to the question put forth by several UN delegates. Namely, what is the motive for the Canemets in offering so many gifts to the people of Earth? On my planet, there is a saying. There are more riddles in a stone than in the philosopher's head. The motives of intelligent beings, though they may at times appear obscure, are simple compared to the complex workings of the natural universe. Therefore, I hope that the people of Earth will understand and believe when I tell you that our mission upon this planet is simply this, to bring to you the peace and plenty which we ourselves enjoy, and which we have brought to other races throughout the galaxies. When your world has no more hunger, no more war, no more needless suffering, that will be our reward. Thank you. Most profoundly. There you have it, gentlemen. Lights, please. I should like to pose a question. Yes, Grigori. Who is responsible for that circus? I assure you, Grigori, the tests were quite genuine. A circus. A second-rate farce. 
If they were genuine, Mr. Secretary, why has debate been stifled? There'll be time for discussion tomorrow, the next day, and throughout the week. No one is stifling debate. I would remind the delegate from Russia that everything the Kenemet has promised is not only worked, but worked beyond our expectations. The force field that was tested yesterday morning, nothing could get through. And suddenly we find ourselves in a brave new age when none of us need fear a hydrogen bomb or a missile. We are on the threshold of peace, Monsieur Gregory. Peace as we have never known it. Niet. I say niet. After that, there was no stopping the Kinemits. They were everywhere, performing miracles of one sort or another around the world. Famine became a thing of the past, as the fertility of arable land increased a hundred percent. The force field proved impervious to any known weapons. Then came a cure for cancer, heart disease, what have you, and, and all from a simple injection. It's hard to say whether the Canaanites enjoyed their role as saviors. Their eyes were so wide apart and set so deep in those big, bland faces that you couldn't read much of an expression. With only a tiny circular hole for a mouth, one that never moved, it was impossible to know what they were thinking because they never spoke. They weren't stern faces, only controlled, placid, almost like kindly masks. And they all looked exactly alike. They sounded the same two calm, mechanical voices that came out of the translation devices under their robes. And then, one day, we were all out of a job, just as I had predicted. The computers and fail-safe machines in the Pentagon sat idle, covered in plastic sheeting, because no one was needed to run them anymore. As for code breakers, I might as well have stayed home. But something kept me there, as if I was waiting for the other shoe to drop. Mr. Chambers? Over here, Pat. I'm going home now, boss. Need me for anything? Like what? This isn't exactly a beehive of activity anymore. You can say that again. The new story of mankind. Nobody needs to decipher anything because, well, there aren't any more codes. Because there aren't any more secret messages. I know. I know. Drink? Well. One for the road, on the house. All right. Odd. What is? I mean, not reading about wars or insurrections or anything anymore. There's a rumor that they're going to disband the United Nations inside of a month. Here you go. The new millennium. Cheers. Cheers. How many Kanemits are here? Anybody ever figure it out? A few thousand, I guess. They've got embassies in every country now, and for every one that comes, a thousand of us take off on one of their ships. Hmm. The reciprocal visits they promised. Now, now that's the odd thing. The ease with which human beings adapt. It's fantastic. One day an astronaut orbits the Earth in a little rinky-dink tin can, and they think it's the biggest moment in the history of mankind. A few years later, they're standing in line waiting to get on a ship that'll take them a zillion miles into space, and they act like they're going on a picnic in the country. That's... <laughs> That's human beings for you. Nothing phases them. Are you going? The exchange program? Uh, I'm on one of their waiting lists. What about you, Patty? Oh, I'm on the list, too. The trouble is, their quota fills up 24 hours after they announce a new departure. But while I'm waiting, I may as well continue studying their language. Good idea. Words reflect the values of the people who use them. If we can understand the vocabulary... I've got a fair command of it now. It's not that hard, really. And there are hints. Huh. Of what? The shades of meaning, the nuances. Some of the idioms are quite similar to English. That's how we unlock the title of the book. I'll get through the rest of it one of these days. More power to you. I gave up a month ago. But if I can help you in any way... Sure, boss. Did I say something? If you can help me... That was the phrase, wasn't it? And I meant it. The only thing you can help me with is... Is what? Help me get rid of this knot in my stomach. What are you talking about? One of those nightmares when... When something's wrong, but you don't know what it is yet. 
little bit of the old sixth sense. That tells you what? Just that maybe we should have looked this gift horse in the mouth, after all. For all we know, it could turn out to be a Trojan horse. Oh, I don't think we've got anything to worry about. I'm going where no man has gone before. How can I resist? Relax. I'll, I'll tell you all about it when I get back. Please, bring your One piece of luggage per person. This way to the loading platform. I'm so excited. I can hardly wait. What do you think it's going to be like? They say they got an average temperature of 76 degrees on their planet, and the sun never goes down. Wouldn't that be something? And their clothing, it's metallic cloth, just beautiful, kind of like spun gold. My sister has a brochure. The day you land, they take you on a shopping tour, and you can have as much of it as you want for free. It's just one big holiday when you get there. They've even got a form of baseball with leagues and everything. Man, I don't think I'll ever come back. And the whole trip, it's millions of miles, mind you, the whole trip only takes a few days. May I help you with your bag? Why, yes, you may. Oh, they're so polite. Please, keep the line moving. Oh, oh, watch your step. Take my arm. Can, can we sit together? Yes, you may sit together once you're inside. We're moving. Almost on board. This is going to be wonderful. Did you bring your camera? Oh, look. They're opening the door to the spaceship. I hope there's going to be other kids my age there. Boarding pass, please. Yes, 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 yes. I do. Mr. Chambers, proceed. Thank you. Mr. Chambers? Mr. Chambers! Pat, hi! Jim, please. You are just in time to say goodbye. Don't get on. Are you kidding? I've been waiting for six weeks. You can refuse. There's still time. Well, don't, don't say that too loud or there'll be a thousand people trampling over you to take my place. Get, get on board, board, please. Not yet. I'm begging you. What, whoa, whoa, what's wrong with you, Pat? I, uh... I, I finally deciphered the book. Hey, that's great. All of it. Your delaying departure. Please continue up the ramp. Uh, w w one moment. Well, Pat? Jim. Jim, the first page is just a collection of English phrases with their own translations. But the rest of the book, the rest of it. Will you move, mister? We're waiting to get on board. Step through the door. Sir. Write me. Write me about it. I have, I'll, I have plenty of time to read letters up there. Not as much time as you think. Jim. Now, Mr. Chambers, we must close the hatch. The rest of the book. It's not what you think. The title, To Serve Man, it's... It's a cookbook. What? No, 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 wait, 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 what? Wait, wait. No. A cookbook. A very specific difference in points of view. To the wee ones, the little race of tourists known as humans, it's a marvelous adventure. A voyage to outer space. A chance to get away on the greatest vacation ever. But to the extra-large, granite-faced individuals known as canamits, it's nothing more than a cattle car. A very comfortable supply ship bringing food from the other end of the universe to a place where appetites must be enormous. As I say, it's all in the point of view. A lesson in language and semantics from the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. Hello, I'm Stacy Keach. I hope you're enjoying this edition of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. To learn more about this series, be sure to log on to our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. You'll find special discounts on our Twilight Zone audio collections, listings of our radio stations, links to other websites, and a photo gallery of our recording studio and some of our stars in action. Plus ways to contact us with questions or comments about the show. And for a limited time, when you log on to twilightzoneradio.com, you can send in for a free CD of the show. So be sure to visit us at twilightzoneradio.com.